So definition of gestational trophoblastic neoplasm, it is a, a group of malignant neoplasm that consists of abnormal proliferation of the trophoblastic tissue that may follow hydrated formal or non-molar pregnancy like abortion, ectopic pregnancy, or full-term pregnancy. And there is a four different types of gestational trophoblastic neoplasm, which could be either in phase of mole, colic carcinoma, which is the most common and usually associated with a high level of the beta HCG, or could be placental side trophoblastic tumor or epithelioid trophoblastic tumor, which is usually rare and associated with a low level of the beta HCG. So 50% of case of gestational trophoblastic neoplasm usually arise after molar pregnancy, but it can be after abortion or tubal pregnancy in around 25%. It could be uh, after term or preterm pregnancy in around 25%. And the most common site of the metastatic disease usually is pulmonary, which is around 80% of the patient. Vagina, 30% of the patient. CNS, usually 10%, but usually all patients with a CNS metastasis usually have concurrent either pulmonary or vaginal metastasis. Hepatic, which is around 10%. Clinical feature, usually patient can be presented with abnormal uterine bleeding, which can be after molar or non-molar pregnancy, uh, amenorrhea, which is more common after non-molar pregnancy, pelvic pain or pressure, and this is mainly because of uterine enlargement of the, or if there is bilateral ovarian complex cyst, uh, beta HCG stimulation effect like bilateral ovarian thecal uterine cyst, hyperthyroidism, and rarely patient may present with a uh, hyperemesis or preeclampsia. Symptoms of metastasis. So if there is a lung metastasis, patient usually can present with a shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, or uh, hemoptysis. If there is a vaginal metastasis, vaginal bleeding, or purulent vaginal discharge, or if there is a CNS metastasis, will present with the neurological symptoms. Rarely fertilization, and this is mainly because of the thecal cell hyperplasia lead to the elevated the level of the hormonal testosterone, or nephrotic syndrome, but both is very rare. So what about diagnosis? So following molar pregnancy, if you have a weekly beta HCG level plateau over three weeks period, I mean day one, day seven, day 14, and day 21, this can diagnose as a gestational trophoblastic neoplasm. If you have increase in the more than 10% across three failures over two weeks duration, day one, seven, 14, if there is resistant of detectable beta HCG for more than six months, after molar evacuation, if there is a histological diagnosis of choriocarcinoma or invasive mole, and if there is evidence of metastasis. So this is following uh, molar pregnancy. Following non-molar pregnancy, if there is elevated beta HCG with evidence of metastatic disease, usually you can make a diagnosis, and usually biopsy should not be performed because this tumor usually is a highly vascular tumor, and by doing biopsy there is a, a risk, high risk of life-threatening hemorrhage. But if you have elevated beta HCG with uterine enlargement only, and there is no evidence of metastatic disease, you may consider histological diagnosis if you are not convinced, because it may be another pregnancy, it could be retained tissue inside the uterus after the pregnancy, or it could be gestational trophoblastic neoplasm. So diagnostic workup, so baseline laboratory test, usually quantitative beta HCG, CBCD, hepatic, renal and thyroid function test because of hyperthyroidism risk, Imaging study, so we usually we do pelvic ultrasound. This is to make sure that you are not dealing with a, another pregnancy. Uh, chest imaging, uh, baseline chest X-ray. And why we use baseline chest X-ray? Because this is the imaging that we need usually for FIGO staging and WHO prognostic score. So we do usually baseline chest X-ray. By doing CT scan of the chest, you may detect micrometastasis in 40% uh, of the patient with a normal chest X-ray. But usually this will not change the outcome. Uh, other imaging study like CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, MRI or CT scan of the brain, this usually should be considered in a selected patient. Like if there is evidence of lung or vaginal metastasis, if a patient has a symptoms like neurological symptoms or laboratory like elevated liver function test that suggest of metastasis, or if there is a histological evidence of choriocarcinoma because we know choriocarcinoma is a highly metastatic, so you better to, to do CT scan of the abdomen or, and pelvis and MRI of brain. So the staging of the gestational trophoblastic neoplasm, stage one means uh, confined to the uterus, stage two extend outside of the uterus, but usually limited to the genital structure, stage three if there is lung metastasis, stage four if there is other metastatic disease. The WHO prognostic scoring system depends on eight risk factor, 
including age, antecedent pregnancy, interval, which is the time between the end of pregnancy and the start of the chemotherapy. Pre-treatment serum beta-HCG, largest tumor, site of the metastasis, number of the metastasis, and prior failed chemotherapy. So if the scoring is 0 to 6, this means low risk. If the scoring is 7 and the high, this means a high risk. Usually, we we need the WHO prognostic score mainly for stage 2 and stage 3 because stage 1 usually low risk while stage 4 usually high risk. And we don't use it, the WHO prognostic score for placental site trophoblastic tumor or epithelial trophoblastic tumor. So differential diagnosis for high level of beta SCG, it could be normal pregnancy, abortion or ectopic pregnancy. The other is ectopic beta SCG producing ovarian uh, tumor in general, like ovarian germ cell tumor, cancer of the stomach, liver, breast, and pancreas. The other differential diagnosis could be pituitary beta SCG, and this is occur at the time of the menopause, which could be either natural or post-surgical. And this is usually because of the luteinizing hormone level peak, usually produced at the same time small amount of the beta SCG, and the level usually between 20 to 40. How can you confirm that the high level of the beta SCG because of the beta 3 usually by using oral contraceptive for three weeks. If there is a suppression of the beta SCG, this means that it is clear the source is beta 3 beta SCG. The other cause is false positive beta SCG, which is called phantom beta SCG, and this is mainly due to circulating heterophilic antibodies. This is a large molecule that mimic the beta SCG when they detect in the serum. How, how can you diagnose? Usually, you will not detect the beta SCG in the urine, and variable beta SCG result when it, when it, I mean, done in a different labs. So, I will talk first about low risk GTN. So, the low risk GTN include stage one GTN, stage two or three with the WHO prognostic sc score less than seven. Low risk GTN can be cured with a single agent chemotherapy. Uh, which is, I mean, when you talk about solid tumor, I mean, this is the, the only disease that you can cure only with a single agent chemotherapy. Overall, excellent prognosis with a cure rate approaching 100%, but sometimes you may, uh, you may require for your patient subsequent treatment to achieve cure in around 20% of the patient. So initial therapy, usually we use single agent methotrexate. Sometimes you may consider hysterectomy for a patient if she doesn't desire long, I mean, fertility, and by doing hysterectomy, you may uh, reduce, uh, I mean, the number of the exposure to the chemotherapy after the surgery, but most of the case, we advise after hysterectomy, you may give one course of the chemotherapy to treat micrometastatic disease. Selfage therapy, which includes single-agent deactinomycin, if a patient failed two single-agent chemotherapy, then we may consider multi-agent multi chemotherapy like Imaco, and you may consider hysterectomy in a selected patient with a chemo-resistant disease if it is a stage 1 disease. So there is a four different chemotherapy regimen. And why we have a four different? Because of lack of high-quality data. There is no randomized trial to combine each regimen with, uh, in between. So, I mean, can be used weekly methotrexate, can be used eight-day regimen of methotrexate, can be used five-day regimen of the methotrexate, or can be used high-dose methotrexate. But the most user, I mean, methotrexate, either weekly, eight-day regimen, and sometimes five-day regimen. Deactinomycin, it could be either bi-weekly pulsed regimen, like 1.25 every two weeks, or it could be five-day regimen for five days every two weeks. So this is 2016 meta-analysis in which a patient with a low-risk GTN treated with a single agent chemotherapy, so comparing single agent deactinomycin versus single agent methotrexate. And this includes seven randomized trial comparing both. And you can see with the actinomycin, there is a high cure rate as a compared to the single agent methotrexate with the relative risk re I mean, ratio is a 0 0.65, which is a significant. From our experience at KFSH, 131 patients with a low-risk gestational trophoblastic neoplasm treated with a chemotherapy. And you can see the complete remission to the initial chemotherapy was around 70%. When you look for a single agent with it was around 53%. Single agent deactinomycin was 87%. Around 25% of the patients require a selfish therapy. 
and over all complete remission either to the initial chemotherapy or subsequent chemotherapy was around 90%. So we, I mean in general, we prefer to give single agent methotrexate because of lower toxicity, decreased cost and advantage of convenience. And we may keep, we may, I mean we may keep uh, the single agent deactinomycin as a selfish therapy for a patient who has methotrexate resistant or as a primary therapy when there is a contraindication to the methotrexate like effusion, renal or hepatic impairment. During therapy, beta ECG should be measured weekly after a complete remission, which is means that beta ECG should be below five, then we can continue for additional three cycles. Sometimes you may consider observation for a patient with a raised beta ECG six months after molar, molar evacuation if it's still falling down. And they found by the study that if you follow only by observation, around 80% of the patients, they may get spontaneous remission. And only maybe 20% of the patients that you may need treatment. So if a patient willing to continue follow up like every two weeks with a beta ECG, and the beta ECG is going down, even after six months, you may consider only observation. High risk GTN, it include stage four disease, or stage two and three with a risk score more than six. Usually treated with a combination chemotherapy and the preferred regimen is IMACO. Over all cure rate for the high risk stage two and three range between 95 to 100%. For stage four, the complete remission is achieved 60 to 70%. Still about 30 to 40% of the high risk GTM patient will develop resistant or relapse and require subsequent combination chemotherapy or surgery. So the IMACO regimen, usually day one will be etopside deactinomycin methotrexate, day two etopside deactinomycin, and day eight will be cyclophosphamide and fincristine, and usually this regimen will be repeating like every two weeks, every two to three weeks. So this is a retrospective study from the Korean center, 227 patients with a high risk GTM treated with either methotrexate deactinomycin or methotrexate deactinomycin and chlorambucil, or CHAMOCA, which is a combination chemotherapy, or IMACO, and they found that the highest remission rate with the IMACO, 91% as compared to the other chemotherapy, which is ranging between 63, 68, or 76% respectively. Lower, I mean, lowest mortality rate with the IMACO, 9% as compared to the other combination chemotherapy. So usually prefer to use IMACO. From our experience, uh, at KFSH, 88 patients with a high risk GTN treated with the combination chemotherapy and you can see the complete remission rate to the initial chemotherapy was 57% and with IMACO, the complete re uh, remission rate was 94% while the other chemotherapy, this is used, I mean, uh, like in 70, I mean, earlier before we, I mean, use IMACO and you can see the, co I mean, the complete remission uh, to the chemotherapy was better with IMACO. 34 percent of the patient require a selfish chemotherapy and offer all complete remission to either an initial chemotherapy and the subsequent chemotherapy or may include the surgery was 73 percent. So usually beta CG should be measured weekly during the therapy for the high risk GTN after complete remission when the beta CG become below five usually will continue for additional three cycles which means like around six weeks. In selected patient with a high tumor burden, initially in order to reduce the early death due to hemorrhage or respiratory compromise, especially if the patient has a bulky lung metastasis, usually we start with a low dose induction chemotherapy. So we use etopside 100 milligram per meter square and cisplatin 20 milligram per meter square on a day one and two repeated weekly for one to three weeks. So you decrease the load, I mean, the load of the disease, the burden of the disease. And then after that, you may continue on IMACO. So the risk of the hemorrhage will be less. So initial therapy, usually we use IMACO chemotherapy. But sometimes if a patient has brain metastasis, we use IMACO with a high dose methotrexate, 1000 milligram per meter square over 24 hours. Better to get a neurosurgical consult prior to the treatment because of the high risk of the complication either with a brain metastasis or as a consequence of the treatment and mainly is intracerebral bleeding. So better to get a neurosurgical consult before that. Some center, they may use whole brain radiation in addition to the IMACO, the high dose, 
and their rationale that by using the whole brain radiation, you may shrink the brain metastasis, you may increase the concentration of the methotrexate in the CCF, and you may reduce the risk of the intracerebral bleeding, but usually this associated with the increase the treatment related toxicity of methotrexate like leukoencephalopathy. Selfish therapy for a patient who failed EMACU, usually we consider EMA-AB, and this means that at day 8, we use etopside cisplatinum instead of cyclophosphamide fincristine. The other regimen that can be used as a third line or uh, is taxol etopside alternating with the taxol cisplatin, BEB, uh, BVB, which is a cisplatin, fimplastin, bleomacine, or bacrotaxyl carboplatin. You may consider surgical resection like pulmonary, hepatic, any if you have a solitary lesion with the chemo resistant. So, the definition of the resistant disease, if patient on treatment and there is increase or plateau in two consecutive beta CG value over two weeks interval, this means are resistant, or if there is a detection of the new metastasis. Recurrent disease means that beta CG re elevate after becoming undetectable for three consecutive weeks. We know that the half, half life of the beta CG is 1.5 three days, so usually it should be, I mean, the, the level should be full by one log over the like 18 days. So if it become like plateau or increase, this means that resistant and you should switch treatment. When a patient get a resistant or recurrent disease, better to do restaging again. So you consider CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and bilfus, and MRI of the brain to decide what treatment. You may consider combination chemotherapy. If there's a solitary lesion, you may consider surgical resection. Sometimes we may consider beta scan to distinguish active disease from fibrotic tumor nodules when there is a plan to do surgery like pulmonary metastectomy, so you, are, you want to be sure that this is active disease or fibrotic nodule. Post-treatment surveillance, after complete remission is achieved, usually we do beta CG level, should be measured monthly for 12 months, then every 3 to 4 months for the second year, then every 6 months for the third year. And 85 to 95% of the recurrence occur within the first 18 months. And usually the risk of the recurrence like 5 to 10% if achieve complete remission. Women should use contraception during the therapy and surveillance to be sure that the beta, I mean, there is no pregnancy in the future. So this will, will make you, I mean, uh, if beta CG elevated with a pregnancy, is it because of the pregnancy or still there is active GTN? So we usually we advise that patient should be in contraception. Patient may attempt to achieve pregnancy after 12 months for low risk gestational trophoblastic neoplasm and 24 months for the high risk gestational trophoblastic neoplasm. What is the definition of the quiescent GTN? Definition, it means plateau of beta ECG at a low level, usually below 200 for at least three months. And usually there is no evidence of primary disease and there is no evidence of metastatic disease typically occur after molar pregnancy or GTN. So patient after molar pregnancy, the beta CG may fall down until become below 200 and then become plateau. And this is more likely if there is no evidence of primary or metastatic disease that quiescent. Usually uh, characterized by little or no hyperglycosated beta CG will be seen on SA due to few cytophoblastic cell. Generally chemo resistant. So usually only what we need is a follow up because 20% can develop GTN, and this is usually you will find with a follow-up two doubling of the beta CG, and beta CG become hyperglycosated in a, more than 20%. So patient, if we consider this patient has a quiescent GTN, usually will follow the beta CG like every month. What about placental site trophoblastic neoplasm and epithelioid trophoblastic neoplasm? Usually characterized by growing more slowly, metastasizing later, involve lymph nodes more commonly, and produce low level of the beta ECG. Most commonly occur after non-molar abortion and pregnancy, but can occur after molar pregnancy. Diagnosed several months or years after pregnancy, usually relatively resistant to chemotherapy, so what we use usually is a combination chemotherapy. Modified WHO prognostic scoring system is not useful for placental site or epitheliotrophoblastic neoplasm. Stage 1 usually treated with a hysterectomy. We may consider adjuvant combination chemotherapy if disease be presenting for more than 4 years of antecedent pregnancy. Stage 2 or 3 
combination of surgery and chemotherapy. Metastatic disease is usually associated with a poor outcome, and we treat with a multi-agent chemotherapy, which could be either IMACO or IMA-AB. So I will give you, I mean, still there is a time. So I'll give you an example for a case presentation. So this is a 30-year-old female, BRA1, uh, BRA1 plus zero, not known to have any medical illness. She had a full-term pregnancy with a spontaneous vaginal delivery at 27 June 2014. She, after that, she had a continuous vaginal bleeding and underwent dilatation and curettage at 22 September 2014, which showed choriocarcinoma. She required blood transfusion twice because of low hemoglobin and continuous vaginal bleeding. She presented at our hospital at 13 October 2014, complaining of mild beefy bleeding on and off with history of mild headache. There was no history of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, shortest of breath, cough, or blurred vision. While she was impatient, she developed one episode of seizure and she was treated with the Kibra. On a physical examination, was unremarkable except that she is pale. Her hemoglobin was 96. Otherwise, renal hepatic function was normal. Beta CG was more than 1 million. And uh, she has a picture of high parathyroidism. T4 was 71.6, which is high, and TSH less than 0.05. So this is the chest X-ray, and you can see there's a, like multiple bilateral well-defined medules in both lungs, and when you account, it is more than 8 minimum. And this is the CT scan, and you can see there is a bilateral multiple pulmonary metastasis. There is a uterine mass, which is around 7 by 4.7 centimeter. There is a bilateral complex ovarian cyst, and this is, it is ovarian thecal uterine cyst, and there is hypodense lesion at the segment 7 of the liver. This is the MRI of the brain, which shows enhancing lesion in the left parietal temporal lobe, and also at the right cerebellar hemisphere. So what stage she has? Stage 4. What is the WHO prognostic score, if you want to account? Hmm? So, yes, so, so it is a stage 4, usually stage 4 high risk. Usually we don't uh, account for a WHO prognostic score. But if you account for this patient, it will be more than 16. So the first... 16. So the first... 30 years, so it is less than, uh, I mean, 40, zero. But she has a full-term pregnancy, which is a four. She has a, uh, she was diagnosed within a four month, so it is zero. Uh, when you talk about beta CG, it is more than 100 million, which is a four. Uh, there is a lung metastasis zero. Uh, I mean, lung metastasis, but if you account, it is more than eight. So it is like a, another four. And also there is a brain metastasis, and the tumor size is 7 by 4.7, which is a, the, the large, I mean, like around 2. So when you account all this, it will be 16. So usually, stage 4 in general is a high risk. So how can you manage this patient? So Imaku, the high dose methotrexate, so you, she received 13 cycle, completed on 13 March 2015. And you can see when you look to the beta CG, it's going down, then at 60, become plateau. So when a patient reach 60, become plateau, this means that maybe resistant disease. So usually we'll do a restaging to show where is the disease now. So by restaging, still there is a bilateral lung metastasis. There is a significant response, like more than 70%, but still there is a bilateral lung metastasis, and the largest was 1.5 centimeter. Now, normal uterus, normal ovary, but there is a new hypodense lesion in the liver in segment 7 and segment liver and segment 8. So there is a new liver metastasis and still the beta SCG plateau. So the brain CT scan, the MRI brain should interval resolution of the enhancing lesion in the left parietal lobe and cerebellar lesion. So it is resolved. So now you have a resistant disease with a plateau beta SCG with a new liver metastasis. So how can you manage this patient? Hmm? Asymptomatic. 
شريفة But why hysterectomy normal uterus and the disease outside the uterus So because there is a new liver metastasis still there is a lung metastasis and beta ECG become plateau at 60 so she was treated with a second line combination chemotherapy there is no brain metastasis no so we give her EMA EB seven cycle completed at 23 August 2015 and you can see the beta ECG dropping down until become below 5 and then achieved complete remission so she finished in August 2015 this repeating CT scan at January 2017 you can see more significant response and the only lesion remaining it is less than 1 cm 6.3 mm which is more likely to be fibrotic nodule and the resolution of the liver metastasis and this lesion since long time is still and most likely hemangioma but the new lesion was in segment 8 and 7 is resolved so this is in January 2017 and on a follow-up repeating beta ECG in January 2018 which is around two and a half years after the last second line of chemotherapy still beta ECG normal okay thank you thank you